Well, greetings, everyone. Um, welcome to this talk on submarines. Uh, we're going to start off right at the very start with uh, chronologically with uh, the HMS A1. The HMS A1, even though uh, there was a, it, it had a predecessor called the Holland One, the A1 was the first all British designed and built submarine. The Holland One was the first br uh, British submarine, which can be seen in, in Gosport, but that was American Irish designed and um, British built, whereas the, the HMS A1 was the first of the A class, which was all British, if you like. Um, it had a chequered career. Uh, it was uh, launched in 1902. Uh, sadly, in 1904, it was taking part in, in exercises off the NAB Tower with other naval craft when it was run down by a liner called the Berwick Castle. The Berwick Castle didn't see the, the periscope until the very last minute, thought it was a practice torpedo and tried to veer away, but unfortunately it, um, it hit the submarine and, and sank it with all 11 crew. Uh, the commander was called Lofty Manserg, but uh, all 11 crew perished and they eventually found the submarine again and lifted it and gave the submariners a decent burial. Um, they, they put it back into service, but it was always considered a, an unlucky boat because uh, obviously there'd been loss of life on there and sailors being superstitious, it, um, it, it always has a bit of a, um, an omen to it, if you like. Um, it, it, uh, it, it served for a few years and then in 1910 it uh, had another accident when a petrol gas explosion blew someone out of the conning tower and uh, that was pretty much the end of her service career. Interestingly, the, the gas alarm or the fume alarm on those old submarines was two or three white mice in a cage and believe it or not, if they fell over, then they, they considered there were fumes inside the boat and it was time to get out. After that, in 1911, she was expended as a target to actually uh, do experimental work uh, to see how, how the submarine hull, the pressure hull, would um, withstand explosions underwater and also for locational sub anti-submarine work. And that was the end of the story for until 1989 when a fisherman friend of mine called Willie Pledger that uh, fishes out of Selsey was trawling off Chichester, uh, uh, quite a way off Chichester, be between Chichester and the Isle of Wight, and he snagged into this wreck and uh, got a couple of friends of his uh, from Selsey to go and have a quick look at it, and then asked me to go over to help them identify it um, definitely, which, which we did. Um, the, the wreck has since become designated, protected if you like, and it's, uh, it's now, we, we'd hoped at one stage to maybe raise finance to actually lift it, but uh, lifting it's not the problem. Actually, conservation and where to put it is the main problem after that. So it didn't happen, basically. The, um, the wreck still lies uh, in situ there. Um, you'll see some cutaways in a second of uh, various photographs I took at the time uh, when we first uh, dived it and also uh, sonar pictures uh, and uh, things that will explain more about how it's laying. Now, when you look at the artefacts, these artefacts are actually superb. I mean, they've been underwater for 80 years, you know, it's a, a long time underwater, but some of them are absolutely superb. If we look at this, for instance, this is a little signal lamp. Now, when you look at that, you'd never believe that that, that had actually been underwater. And, um, and, and basically, uh, the teak and the wonderful little dovetail joints are still immaculate. But if you open it up, you'll see that it, um, it's, it's suffered the effects of underwater corrosion and what we call crud, which is the marine growth conglomerate. We left that in there to just give the example of, uh, of how it is, uh, you know, um, with marine growth. Several other items in here. One poignant little item is this little pipe, you know, someone's pipe, uh, smoker's pipe, and uh, that, we treasure that little item. We've got all sorts in here. We've got the steam whistle, the little uh, steam whistle there, look, and um, the, the main control gauge down there. Uh, you'll see that in a separate photograph, the compass. Even um, beer bottles and even uh, rum bottles with rum still inside, which uh, is, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's drinkable, but it's, uh, you, you, if you're brave, you could actually drink it. 
if you uh, if you're feeling that <laughs> that way inclined. The, sh the the bell, obviously, and the main compass binnacle. The loss of the A1 was a tragic event, but uh, the good thing was that they actually located the submarine afterwards, uh, recovered it, and, and uh, gave the sailors a decent burial in Portsmouth. Now, coming back to the artefacts, um, we've got here a, a, a little signal pistol, you know, a little very pistol, which is in beautiful condition. When you look at the, the actual condition of these, these items, uh, you know, after being uh, you know, underwater for 80 years, as I said, it's amazing what good quality they used in those days, especially in the Royal Navy, obviously, because it was, it was the, the um, you know, everything had to be top-notch. One of the most interesting ar ar articles from my point of view is having found many, many uh, pairs of binoculars uh, over the years underwater on, on shipwrecks, uh, it's very rare you find some that are, are actually restorable and uh, these are just immaculate, you, know, you can even see through them which is the first time I've ever come across binoculars that you can actually restore back to working order so look at those, they're absolutely fabulous, a lovely piece. Uh, the, um, now this is the engine room telegraph you can see all the markings on there, look, and the little arrow uh, ahead, astern, uh, again, beautiful qual quality and shows what uh, superb workmanship there was around in, at the turn of the century. Various other things, gauges, um, thermometers, um, as I say, uh, the rum bottles, the crockery from the wreck. Uh, there's a multitude of, of items here, but you know, basically this was only recovered to protect it because at the end of the day, a lot was um, pilfered by, m once the position of the wreck became known, unfortunately people didn't respect the fact that it was uh, designated. Uh, the ownership, you know, we managed to actually um, acquire the, the, the wreck from the MOD. And Uh, so that's basically the story of the, the A1. Uh, tragic, tragic event, but um, you know, it was early days for submarine development and uh, obviously there were going to be accidents. Right, our next submarine is going to be the UB-81. Now the UB-81 was a First World War German submarine and it was commanded by a, a very famous U-boat ace called Salzweedle. Uh, he'd uh, sunk something like 130,000 tons of Allied shipping in the First World War, so he was very well known, and uh, I think he was 11th on the list of top aces of the, uh, the German U-boat uh, command. And he'd come down through the English Channel to take up position around uh, the, the busy shipping areas. Well, obviously, uh, St. Catherine's Point, um, you know, the, the, the headlands of the, uh, the Owers lightship, the ships always came in there to, to try and navigate where they were by dead reckoning or, or whatever. And um, uh, so they were obviously a good point for the submarines to, to hang around to try and catch them as they went past because they knew they'd be fairly close to land at that point to get land bearings. Now, the UB-81 had another, also had a sad ending because it hit a, hit a mine off St. Catherine's Point, southeast of St. Catherine's Point, and it um, hit a mine on the stern of the, uh, of the submarine, so this, this, that they managed to shut the doors, the watertight doors, to the after section, but it sank by the stern. Fortunately for them, it was only in about, uh, well, in meters, about 30 meters of water, or 35 meters of water, so the actual length of the submarine, with the bottom, uh, the stern touching the bottom, they then tried to inflate. It was quite a um, enterprising U-boat commander, sorts of. He, was, he obviously wanted to save his crew, and they managed to get enough buoyancy into the bow of the submarine to actually get the torpedo tubes just above the surface of the sea. 
it's quite a rough night, unfortunately, because uh, that added to the problem. Uh, they couldn't quite get enough buoyancy to get it really clear of the water, but the, the waves were literally lapping into the, uh, the, the open torpedo tubes. A lot of the people were too big to actually fit into the torpedo tubes, so they were you know, obviously considering what their future was going to be and th contemplating suicide for a quick ending. Um, but the smaller people got managed to crawl up and into the, the top of the tube and, and fire off distress signals because it was better for them to be captured than to, uh, than to actually sink to the seabed and all perish. The, the, the signals were seen by some naval vessels and a, a, a pea boat, a patrol boat, actually uh, came up and tried to get on the weather side of um, the, uh, the bow of the submarine sticking out and try to effect a rescue of the crew that had come out. There were about seven got out initially, uh, but it got so cold, uh, you know, they were there for a long time before any rescue craft arrived because the signals weren't seen. Uh, they, they got so cold, they almost contemplated going back inside and taking their chances inside. Saltsweedle Weedle stayed down below with his crew. And when the pea boat uh, eventually came alongside, it, it was trying to maneuver alongside to get the survivors. And bear in mind, this is the middle of the winter. And um, it, unfortunately, it uh, wave pushed them onto the U-boat and it actually sank the U-boat. So the rest of the crew perished and only those seven people survived. Uh, he was a very famous U-boat uh, ace and um, had commanded various submarines in the First World War. But uh, these pieces here, you'll see, this is the main uh, foghorn, the uh, Conningtown foghorn, and a, f a little steam whistle there from the UV-81 as well, and some other items there. So uh, we, we, we recovered quite a few bits off that. Now while we're here, we'll move on to the, uh, the next uh, submarine, which is the, U uh, the U-90. Now the U-90 was, uh, uh, again, a First World War submarine, quite a big, uh, big submarine, 600 tons. Uh, it surrendered at the end of the war, so basically there were no crew on it when it was lost because it was actually being towed to the breakers yard in, in Pembroke after it had been uh, surrendered to the British authorities. Now, there's, it's quite questionable about being lost on tow because if you think about it, a submarine is used to being underwater, so why did they, so many get lost under tow? And, and the answer to that is probably they were very awkward things to tow and um, probably the towing crews got fed up of, uh, <laughs> of towing them and, and probably scuttled a few because there are so many out in the English Channel that were actually lost under tow. Now, I found the U-90 back in the, the mid-1980s, 1987 uh, sort of time, and um, I was tracking up and down looking for wrecks uh, with the magnetometer and the sonar equipment, systematically covering areas down around the Isle of Wight. I've actually done about, probably, I don't know, hundreds of square miles that I've covered now of, of doing that very thing, just going up and down, up and down, and finding wrecks. Uh, so in that era, the 70s and 80s, I found a lot of uncharted wrecks and uh, obviously we targeted a few that uh, were ones that um, I wanted to find. U-90 was one of those and the report was, there were several conflicting reports about where it was lost and if it was lost, uh, but according to my records it was lost off St Catharines uh, on the way to the breakers yard. I found it with a magnetometer and dived it and uh, there it was intact on the seabed uh, big old U-boat um, with just laid over probably f a bit more than 45 degrees and I swam around it and and one of the things I found first at the base of the conning tower on the seabed was this lovely um, beautiful World War One periscope which you can see again like the A1 stuff is, is absolutely brilliant quality now, if you can imagine, that's quite a heavy piece. And I was down probably 30 meters, 35 meters uh, to the seabed. And I climbed, I had a downline on top of the conning tower. And I thought, I've got to get that up the side of the, 
the thing back to the downline to be able to tie it on and, and recover it because it was such a nice piece for the museum. There was no loss, loss of life on the U90, as I mentioned, so it's not a war grave, it was just a surrender boat and so it was okay to take bits off and I actually did actually purchase the wreck sometime afterwards from the MOD. There's another piece there, the, um, that's the sighting ring there with the, the um, compass um, degrees on there and got the top off the other periscope as well which is just the top section and this is the other section of um, the top of the other periscope you can see there's the, there's the collar there the U90, uh, this is the actual conning tower wheel, uh, the brass wheel uh, that I recovered at the time. Uh, it's, it's amazing because some of these things, like the, uh, the, the large periscope there, sometimes the interaction between dissimilar metals, that things fall off. And, uh, you know, I was quite surprised to see that large periscope section on, on the seabed. Again, you'll see from the, the photographs, there's, there's quite a few nice photographs of, um, of the U-90 as found. I mean, I haven't dived it for years now, so it's probably changed a lot. And that basically is the story of the U-90. Uh, it's quite a popular wreck for people to dive now, and I just hope people respect it and, and don't tear too many pieces off it, because it's, uh, it's quite a visual wreck to dive. Now the next submarine we're going to talk about is uh, one of the most significant ones for, for, from my point of view because it's uh, probably one of the most important wrecks I've ever located. Uh, a strange story behind it because uh, it was a total surprise to me to find the HMS Swordfish in this area because nobody ever, ever, ever for one moment thought that it was anywhere near here. So when you're looking for wrecks or looking for uh, uncharted wrecks, which I was in that era. Um, you've done the research basically, and you've uh, you've sort of got a pretty much a list of what what is in the area. Obviously, there will always be a few unknowns, but uh, this one was the biggest surprise of my career, really. The wartime mystery of the disappearance of the Royal Navy submarine HMS Swordfish has been solved. A civilian diver stumbled onto the wreck of the Swordfish just off the Isle of Wight. It had been thought she'd been sunk by German destroyers near Brest on the French coast. It now seems she hit a mine just a few miles from home in Gosport. The Navy Submarine Museum there say it's an exciting find. Jenny Murray reports. The museum's memorial tablet remembers the men of the swordfish and gives the date of her sinking as the 16th of November 1940. The Times of the 24th of December announces that nothing has been heard of her and she must be presumed sunk by the Germans. It pays tribute to her captain, her brave service, and her 40 crew, many from the south of England. An S-type diesel submarine, she was the first of the class which took the brunt of the early war years. Nine out of 12 were lost. Dive, 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 dive. Launched in 1931, it was on the 7th of November 1940 that she sailed out of her home at Gosport's Fort Blockhouse. It was at the end of the year when we most feared invasion, and we had strung out the only handful of submarines that could be spared along the channel from east to west to report primarily any major shipping movements uh, across the channel which might threaten us, and secondly to attack them if the opportunity came. Swordfish was to take the westernmost billet off Ushant and Brest but she never reached her destination. In 150 feet of water, just south of the Isle of Wight, she made her test dive with the intention of resurfacing and continuing her journey under cover of darkness. As she dived, she hit a German mine, believed to have been laid by U-28 a few weeks before. She was never heard of again until now, when divers brought pictures of her to the surface. The submarine was sat on the seabed upright, apart from the forward section which had been blown off. Uh, very spectacular because the water is quite clear this year, which is unusual in that area. And um, it was just a spectacular sight, really. As a war grave, Swordfish herself will remain sacrosanct. Her exact location will never be revealed. There is to be a memorial service, 
and the museum will ask permission to raise her wheel from the seabed, the only artifact from a submarine war grave. Now, we move forward to 1983, and like with some of the other uh, wrecks I've uh, spoke about, like the U-90, I was tracking up and down, uh, looking at new areas. And when I came across the swordfish on the echo sounder, which you'll see some photographs of, of the traces in a minute, I thought, oh, that looks very much like a U-boat, because I had no idea at the time that the swordfish was in anywhere near here. In fact, I didn't, it hadn't flagged up at all. But when I dived on the wreck, it, fortunately, very rarely do we get good conditions in that area south of St. Catharines, but the visibility that particular day was very good. And, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I could actually see what I was doing. So when I hit the seabed, I actually looked up and saw this conning tower, and I thought, yeah, it's a submarine. But it wasn't until I actually had a good look at it, I thought, well, it looks more like a, a British boat than a, a U-boat. And then I scraped the, the, the telegraphs, the engine room instruction telegraphs in the conning tower, and sure enough, it had Chadburn's, uh, which was the main manufacturer of engine room telegraphs. So I thought, wow, this is a, a real mystery because, you know, I, I don't know of any British submarines lost in this area except for the HMS Upstart, which was uh, scuttled as a target a little bit further south, uh, southwest. So it was all a bit of a, a surprise to me, but then I managed to pick up again. We talked about electrolytic corrosion of things falling off through interaction between uh, bronze and uh, ferrous metal. And on the seabed, I found um, some name, ne name letters, uh, an S and a W. And when I came back and looked up the submarine, because the periscopes were quite individual, um, and it, it, I obviously then found out it was an S-class submarine, and then by a process of elimination, the, the S and the W gave me the swordfish or the sea wolf. Well, um, so that was had to be it. Uh, the, the Navy, I informed them straight away, I informed the Submarine Museum. They requested me to bring up anything that would identify uh, the wreck, you know, without actually removing anything off it, because it was a, a war grave, and we obviously had to respect that. But there were a few items on the seabed. These were some of the conning tower um, ladder rungs, which had also fallen off and were at the base of the conning tower on the seabed. Um, it, 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 it hit big news. I mean, it, was on, it, it amazed me just how much publicity it, it gained because it was on the, the national nine o'clock news, it was on all the local news, and I was asked to go over to a, a press conference in Portsmouth, which I expected to be just the Portsmouth Evening News and the Southern Echo. And when I got there, there were these hordes of um, BBC cameras, ITV cameras, and it horrified me because at that time I wasn't one for being stuck in front of a camera. Um, but, the, but the best thing about the whole story was that it, it, it developed lots of friendships with um, descendants of those lost crew. One in particular, and we'll put a little photograph in there, was a, a lady called Kath Morgan. And she was uh, married to the telegraphist uh, only shortly before he was lost. Now, Kath was a lovely lady from Derby, up, uh, up north, and every year after that discovery in 1983, she would come down to the museum and use it like a memorial, because obviously beforehand, they didn't have any um, memorial to relate to. All they knew that the submarine had disappeared, and no one knew where it was, and it was assumed it was 250 miles away off Brest. Yeah, Kath Morgan, as I said, she was a lovely lady, and... Um, not only did she come down every year after the uh, after the submarine was discovered, um, but she put it in her will, and I obviously had got to know her, her daughter and um, other people uh, of her immediate family. Uh, she asked me to scatter her ashes when she died on the actual wreck of the swordfish, uh, which I did. I took them out there and and um, scattered them in in memory of her. So that was quite a poignant event too. The, the memorial service that was held in November that year, in 1983, uh, just a few months after I'd found the wreck, uh, again, that was a poignant time because uh, 235 people 
relatives, relations of those lost crew turned up for 40 lost crews. So that's six people per lost crew member, and that's 40, 43 years later after the event of the sinking. That touched me a bit because, uh, you know, there were a lot of people there that uh, obviously were glad that the wreck had actually been found and they could actually know what had happened to their loved ones and where they were. And we honour the memory of 40 officers and men, officers and men of HMS Swordfish, the sunken wartime submarine which was found off the Isle of Wight earlier this year. 230 relatives attended the service. The finding of the submarine means that an episode of wartime history will have to be rewritten because, until now, it had always been assumed the swordfish sank off the French coast. Names on a roll of honour. In all, 40 officers and men who served and died aboard the submarine swordfish. The loss of the swordfish 43 years ago in November 1940 was one of the Second World War's biggest mysteries. It was assumed sunk off Ushant by German destroyers when she joined a thin line of submarines fighting to prevent the invasion of Britain. But it's now clear she struck a mine laid by a German U-boat off the Isle of Wight. The wreck of the swordfish was discovered by accident in July by diver Martin Woodward, who runs the Maritime Museum at Bembridge. What sort of condition is she in? Very good condition, considering the age. Um, it's broken in half, obviously, where the explosion was. Uh, but otherwise, the after part is completely upright and uh, stood up as a submarine would be. She's pretty recognisable. Oh, very much so, yes. At first, I thought it was a U-boat, but... Um, on subsequent research and looking around it, I got an idea of what exactly it looked like, and, uh, and it was obviously British. Did you bring anything up with you from her? Only things for identification purposes, such as uh, one of the name letters. There was an actual S letter still attached to the conning tower, and a W laying on the seabed, which I brought up, and of course that more or less tied it in because it was the only one of the S class with a W in the name. The exact position of the swordfish will remain a secret kept by Martin Woodward and the Royal Navy. Two weeks ago, a wreath was laid over the spot where 40 men died by the captain of HMS Otis. The news of the finding of the submarine resulted in more than 200 surviving relatives being contacted for today's service at the Church of St. Ambrose at HMS Dolphin. Among them, Kath Morgan, who married her wartime sweetheart, Jack Wood, only days before she lost him. Jack was a telegraphist on board the swordfish. The commander of the submarine was Michael Langley. His sister, Mrs. Pamela Lloyd, recalls he was well aware of the risks involved. He was always talking to my mother and trying to impress upon her that he would be, uh, his chance of survival were very small. I think something like yes. two submarines were actually going two down a week. Two submarines a week, so he told me we were losing two submarines a week at that time. Now, how did you hear of the loss of the swordfish? I was rung up by my parents, and presumably the letter had come to my father's next of kin. And he had gone to his office before the post arrived, and I was sitting on the hall table until he came back, nobody sort of taking any great, making any significance about it. I shall never forget his face when I went over, which I did immediately, of course. And uh, he told me what had happened. And the good, great difficulty was we couldn't let anybody know for so long because they weren't, uh, the Germans had not uh, claimed the sinking of the submarine, so they thought it, it struck a mine. Mrs. Lloyd's father was invited to Buckingham Palace to accept Commander Langley's posthumous award of the Distinguished Service Cross from King George VI. Is she now relieved the mystery has been cleared up? I personally, and I think my sister agrees with me, uh, we both wish nothing had been found and it had just gone down in the North Sea, as we had thought. On the other hand, we are very pleased that he was struck by a mine and he wouldn't have known anything about it. This afternoon's memorial service puts the record straight on a wartime mystery that has baffled the experts for years. At HMS Dolphin, a plaque commemorates the loss of the swordfish with the wrong date. 
It's recorded she was hit several days after leaving Gosport on November the 16th, 1940. But the finding of the wreck off the Isle of Wight means she was lost on November the 7th, only hours after leaving her base. The error will be put right, as 43 years later, the wreck of the swordfish sleeps on, undisturbed in the channel. Yeah, I feel a, a great attachment to the wreck because it was, a, it was such a surprise to find it because I, I usually know what is in that area, but uh, this was totally out of the blue. And there's been a lot of nice reaction, as I said, and you feel quite sort of moved by it all in, in the end. I think it will be quite a sort of moving day. The, um, the little bit of film that we'll show you now um, is that taken back in about about 20 years ago
Now our next submarine is the U-1195. Uh, she was a Second World War Class 7C U-boat, which was a mass-produced version for the when the Germans were running out of materials uh, during the once the war was ongoing. Obviously, they lost a lot of U-boats, and uh, materials were becoming scarcer. So they sort of uh, built these things uh, very, very quickly out of um, whatever materials they could access. They're not the same quality as we've seen on the the previous World War I uh, boats and the early World War II boats. U-1195 was uh, commanded by a, um, a, a submarine commander called Cortez, and he'd uh, had a, a fairly successful career, uh, also sinking quite a lot of Allied shipping. But they, they came up into the English Channel and uh, they actually torpedoed a, a, a large merchant ship, 11,420 ton ship called the Cuba, the SS Cuba. It was a, a, a French ship that had been requisitioned for um, carrying troops. It was a big ship. And the U1195 spotted it um, off the hour, hours light ship, sort of southeast of the Isle of Wight. Um, and uh, torpedoed it. They put a torpedo in a big ship to sink, and it's obviously still there to this day. Uh, unfortunately for the U1195, there was a, s a destroyer called the HMS Watchman uh, uh, that uh, was in the area and quick quickly bore down on the U1195, and despite them trying to evade the destroyer, they de uh, the Watchman uh, successfully uh, depth charged the U-boat and basically a lot of the crew went down with it. There were some survivors and uh, there's a good story to this because um, the actual U-boat is, is probably southeast of the Isle of Wight by about uh, eight or nine miles and this was recovered off it back in the 1970s uh, so and it was passed on to me. I didn't actually recover this piece uh, but this was passed on to me some years ago. Um, the what we did was, um, in conjunction with this, the, the, the HM Submarine Museum in, in Gosport, and a, a great character called uh, Gus Britton, who was the assistant director in the 1980s. He was also an ex-submariner. He served on the U, uh, the, the Uproar and the U-class boats. And he arranged, they had a tremendous camaraderie between them and the German U-boat survivors of the war. And they obviously uh, went to each other's functions and they never considered each other enemies. They were just adversaries uh, doing the same job uh, thank thanks to their governments that had caused the war. They were just ordinary citizens that were instructed to do what they were, were told to do in the navies. And as a result of that, they, they just considered a, this camaraderie between U-boat people and British submarine people, it was, it was just quite a normal thing. Gus Britton organized a, um, for some of the survivors. Uh, I'd been in touch with a, a, one of the survivors called Rudy Weisser, a German guy who lived on the island of Silt um, in Germany. And I obviously communicate with people, whatever wrecks I dive, I always try and find the human element uh, behind it. And if there's any survivors, it's always great to get the actual story from the horse's mouth. But Gus organized a, a reunion in conjunction with some of the German archivists and U-boat uh, crews, and we got these uh, survivors over. Uh, Rudy Weisser, a very sprightly 63-year-old at the time, this is in 1988, and um, his co-crew member was a, a guy called Herbert Seligal. Uh, and they, it was a poignant event because what we did, I'd agreed to actually take out, um, take, to, well, they came out on a separate boat, but I uh, took my boat out there. We got a wreath and I actually took it down to uh, actually tie to the periscope with them above, uh, stating the names of their lo lost crew members. It was, it was a sad and um, poignant event, but obviously for them it was putting history to bed, if you like. And the whole thing went well. And it was a flat, calm day in the middle of the summer, and it was, couldn't have been a better day, really. Um, and it was good to actually talk to people that had actually been there at that event when the submarine sank. Now, Cortez, uh, the commander, perished with the boat, as did uh, quite a few others. But at least there were some survivors, and they were, uh, they were obviously taken aboard the, 
the watchman and, uh, and looked after. So that's the U1195. You'll see some of the photographs of the press cuttings and the crew members um, when they came over for their visit in 1988. Now I've got to add here that, that Gus Britton, who was a tremendous character and did a huge amount for the Submarine Museum in Gosport, uh, especially on the human element side, he sadly died uh, some years ago now from a heart attack, but he, he sh should be remembered as a really great guy uh, with um, submarine history.